Assalamualaikum. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to class. Good to see all our um, in-person students. Welcome to our online students. Thank you for joining us. And also welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture uh, later on. Um, last couple of weeks, we were studying chapters one and chapter two. We were looking at how to discover God's plan and purpose. And we looked at how many guideposts? Nine guideposts. Okay. So do you remember what are the nine guideposts? Which is the first one? First one is God's word. Okay. General teaching in God's word. Second one, seeds. Okay. Third one, you're stirring within how God stirs you and moves you towards things. Fourth one, the grace of God, fifth one, how God orchestrates circumstances, okay? And um, sixth one is the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us, teaches us, counsels us, okay? The seventh one, um, yes, godly counsel and wisdom we can also receive from other people. And the eighth one is recognizing the times and seasons and the ninth one is uh, to recognize God's pattern of working in your life so I hope uh, those of you who've taken this seriously who've you know looked at it studied this it has helped you to at least understand you know or helped you to you know know what is God's plan and will for your life because when you ask many people most of them say I don't know what is God's plan for my life or what's God's plan for this season, okay? We don't have to walk uh, blind, you know, we don't have to walk ignorant because God reveals his plan and purpose for our life um, in every season. He also prepares us for the next season, so he reveals his plan for the next season. And so he reveals it through various ways. We just looked at these nine um, guideposts. These are just not like, you know, written on stone, kind of, not the Ten Commandments, you know, but God can move in various ways. He can teach us in various ways. He can, Holy Spirit can lead us and speak to us in various ways. But what we need to do is, you know, we need to ask God, God, what is your plan and purpose? What are you teaching me in the season? What is the next season? How do you want me to prepare God? So then life becomes more meaningful and purposeful. You're not just like, okay, I'll do this. Somebody told you to do this. Okay, I'll do this. It's not working out. I'll try something else. That's not working out. Nothing is working out in life. And, you know, we walk around very disappointed, dejected, but it's because we're not asking God what is his plan and purpose for our lives. When he asks, we ask him, he knows because he created us, right? He wired us. He, he created us. So when you have a problem with your two-wheeler or you know you go to a mechanic you don't go to a doctor right when you have a problem with your body who do you go to a doctor you don't go to a mechanic right because they can help you the same way you want to know God's will and plan for your life the best person to go to is God himself and the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you so today we're going to look at chapter three it's on um, page number 28 understanding God's preparation process. Before that, we'll just pause for a word of prayer. Um, <clears throat> sorry, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Online students, you can unmute your mics and pray. In-person students, anyone? Where's the mic? Where's the mic? Can anyone lead us in prayer, please? Quickly? Almighty Father, thanks for giving us this, this wonderful opportunity, Lord. Fill us with, fill us, fill us with your great knowledge Lord, through, throughout this, our classes, Lord, so that we can grow in your spiritual life, Lord. Give us with a great knowledge, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you this, for this opportunity to learn, to learn from your word. We know that many of them do not have this opportunity, so we just commit this next two hours into your hands. We pray that you would remove every kind of spiritual lethargy and dullness and boredness and sleepiness. We cast out 
all of those spirits in the name of Jesus. We speak of freshness of mind and body and spirit so that we can receive, God, all that you're speaking to us, what you are telling us to do, what you want us to act on. And we pray that we will be people who are not only heroes of your word, but also doers. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we need to understand God's preparation process. You know, before God takes us to fulfill a specific function for our lives, he prepares us to fulfill that purpose. So wonderful, right? What a loving God we have. How mindful of him. He just does not say, hey, take, this is your purpose. This is my will for your life. Go and do it, right? He not only just gives, gives us his plan and purpose, he also prepares us and he also enables us. He gives us the grace he gives us the anointing and he helps us to fulfill the calling and the task that he has for us. Okay. So we need to get ready, you know, to um, go about fulfilling God's plan and purpose. And for that, we need to get ready for God to prepare us for it. Okay. So even in the natural, right? Now, some of you have would have had dreams of becoming an engineer or a doctor or a chef or pilot, a teacher you know, um, a nurse, whatever, okay, a business person, um, or you wanted to do something with um, computers, what do you have to do in the natural when you want to fulfill a dream? You have to study, right? You don't just have to 10 standard, you don't say, hey, I want to become a doctor. And the next day, you don't take that white coat and the stethoscope and go around healing people. Do you do that? No. You finish your 12th standard and then you go into medical school, you study for the next five and a half years, and then you go for internship, and then you want to, you know, um, specialize in some, you know, um, uh, specific area of medicine, you do that because that gives you more, uh, you know, um, visibility that helps you to earn more and to progress in life. So there's a lot of study that we do even in worldly things, even if you want to be a chef, you want to be a pilot, you want to be a teacher, you have to finish your degree, you have to finish your B.Ed. and all of those things or an M.Ed. or an M.A. to teach, to become a lecturer or a teacher in uh, school. Okay, so when we take so much of time in the natural to prepare ourselves to earn a degree and to do something in life, then in a similar way, God prepares us for his plan and his purpose that he has in store for us okay so what does god want to accomplish through the preparation process what is god trying to do even as he prepares us you know to fulfill his plan and purpose so can somebody please read second timothy chapter 2 verses 19 to 21 it's on page number 28 in your publication nevertheless the solid foundation of god stands having the seed the lord knows those who are his and let everyone who named the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also the wool and clay, some, of, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel, of, he will be vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Amen. I like to focus on this last phrase. Okay, thank you for reading. The last phrase, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work work so what is god trying to accomplish through the preparation pro process what do you think is the answer from the last phrase so that he can prepare us to do every good work yes so tell your neighbor you need to be prepared for every good work amen okay each one of us need to be prepared for every good work right uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says that we have been created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God planned ahead of time that we should walk in them. Okay, Ephesians 2 10 says God created us in whom? 
in Christ Jesus. And why are we created? Why are we all created? Look at Ephesians 2.10. Why are we all created? To do good works, right? So some of you thinking, hey, what's my purpose in life? Why am I here? What am I doing here on this earth, right? It's not just to uh, get a degree, you know, to get married, have children and, you know, old age and wait till you go to heaven. No, God has created you for what? To do good works, amen? And these good works, when did he plan them? Ahead of time, before even time began. Can you see how much God loves us and how mindful he is of each one of us? And how much is thought of you even before you are born? So some of you think nobody loves me, nobody cares for me, nobody thinks good for me. We need some of these things, you know, is automatically comes in our mind. The enemy just puts these lies. You need to know that God has good works for you. Amen. And he has planned all of this ahead of time. And what should we do? Look at verse, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Look at your Bibles, please. What does it say? What should we do? We should walk in them. What should all of you do? You should walk in them. Okay? So God is going to prepare you and you need to walk in those good works. Amen? So tell your neighbor, be ready to walk in God's good works. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verses 19 to 21 that we read, we see there are four very essential things there. The first thing, God wants us to be a vessel of what? A vessel of honor. That means he wants us to be a vessel. Vessel means what? He wants our bodies to be a vessel of honor and not dishonor. That means what? how we speak, how we act, how we uh, treat other people, Everything that we do should be honoring to God because we are a vessel of honor to God. Secondly, he wants us to be, look at your notes, uh, your publication. He wants us to be sanctified. He wants us to be sanctified, set apart for his use. So all of you are sanctified. That means you are set apart for God to use you. Amen. Aren't you proud of yourselves? There's nothing that you can be proud of. You can be proud of yourself that God has chosen you, set you apart to do something, uh, so to do good works that he has planned ahead of time. What is the third thing? He wants us to be fit, right? He wants us to be fit. And what is the fourth thing? Prepared for every good work. Okay. Now, the first two things about vessel of honor and being sanctified has to do with you as a person. Okay. I'll say that again. The first two things about God wanting to you to be uh, a vessel of honor and to be sanctified has to do with you as a person. The third and the fourth has to do with what God does through you. So two important things. God is not just interested in what he can do through you. Before he does anything through you, what is he interested in? He's interested in your character. He's interested in you as a person. Okay? So God is not interested in how much you do for him. God is more interested in your character. Right? Uh, so who you are to God is more important than what he does through you. Amen? So God is more interested in who you are as a person rather than more interested than what you do as a person so he's interested in your character more than what you uh, what god does through you so often you know we make a mistake we only focus on what god does through us say hey he's a great worship leader he's a great pastor he's a great apostle he's a great prophet he's a great minister that is who god is using him but god is more interested not that you're an apostle you're a prophet a pastor, a teacher. Yes, that is his calling that he's given to you, but he's more interested in your character, who you are as a person. So please tell your neighbor, God is interested in your character. So we look at the life of three men of God in the Bible, and we'll see how God took them through the preparation process and how long it takes for the preparation process. 
Now we all come from a very instant generation, right? Give me quick, fast, you know, everything should be quick and fast. Even food should be like two minute noodles, you know, just take your food, put it in hot water, op cut open and eat it. We just are an instant generation. We want everything like this, so fast and so quick. We are not having the patience to wait. So when God is taking us through the preparation time, you're saying, God, five years, 10 years, 30 years, 40 years, God, what are you doing? When will I start ministry? God is saying, be patient, my child. So we look at three men in the Bible and see how long the preparation process took for them. Okay, so we will not be in a hurry then. Okay, the first person we look at is Moses. Now Moses, you know, God supernaturally arranged for him uh, to be in Pharaoh's palace. Okay, and he was trained with all the wisdom and the knowledge of the Egyptians. And God trained, took him to Pharaoh's palace and trained him in all of these things because he was going to be the next leader. God was going to use him as the deliverer for his people. So it says in the Bible that when, when Moses, um, you know, was um, um, 40 years old, we, we looked at his life and we studied recognizing the seeds in your life. We saw that, you know, when it was, he was 40 years old, he knew in his heart that God has called him or raised him up to be a deliverer for his people. Okay. But what did he do? He was super excited. He did not wait for God's timing. He, you know, he went ahead in his own uh, flesh and in his own enthusiasm. He did not wait for God. He just went ahead and he killed an Egyptian because he wanted to show his people, the Hebrew people, that, hey, I'm a deliverer. I'm here to save you. And that caused 40 years of delay, right? Because he had to run away from Egypt because the Pharaoh was looking to kill him. He went away into the wilderness and it took 40 years for that Pharaoh to die. And at the age of 80, God calls Moses at the burning bush, okay? So 40 years more it took, right? Uh, but even though he recognized God's plan and purpose, you know, uh, he acted in the flesh. So there's something that we can learn from this, that every time you and I step out in the flesh, anytime you and I do things in the flesh, we are going to delay the unfolding of God's plan and purpose. Please hear this carefully very important. It's not there in your books. You can write it down. Every time you and I step out in the flesh, that means in our own carnal nature, in our own desires, anytime we step out, we are going to delay the unfolding of God's plan and purpose. So if you are going to delay God's plan and purpose, you are going to, you're stepping out in your flesh. Want me to repeat that? Every time you and I step out in the flesh, we are going to delay God's plan and purpose for our life. Okay. So Moses, you know, 40 years was he was in the wilderness. Was it God's plan for him to be there? Was it God's plan for him to be in the wilderness for 40 years? No, it was not God's plan. But because of his own choice, he landed up there. Okay. Then once the Pharaoh died, at the age of 80, God calls Moses and gives him the assignment to go and set the people free. So we see that even when we make mistakes, it delays things, but God is faithful. He can still use us when we repent and when we go back to him. Okay. So we see that Moses goes back to Egypt, you know, and that delayed things even for the Egyptian, for the, the, the Hebrew people. What did God tell Abraham? Uh, how many years his, um, his descendants will be in an unknown country? 400 years. But how long did it take? 430 years. Did God delay the 30 years? Was God wrong in saying 400 and moved it to 430? No. It was the delay was why? Because of Moses, whom he chose as a deliverer who he acted in the flesh, did things that were wrong, it delayed things. So when you don't walk in God's plan and purpose, it's going to delay things. When you don't go through the preparation process in the right way, it's going to delay things for you and for your family and people associated with you. So 
see here it took 30 more years right for Moses for people to be delivered out of Egypt and even when Moses delivered them out of Egypt what happens you know was he able to enter the promised land no, no. why he did a mistake he disobeyed God right instead of um, speaking to the rock he struck the rock okay so that uh, stopped him from going entering the promised land he was just able to see the promised land okay so for God disobedience is disobedience the price that we need to pay okay so um, the next person we look at is David okay so how many years did it take for God to fulfill his plan and purpose through Moses 40 years right we'll go on to the next person David can you take the mic, please? David was a shepherd boy. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, uh, like if we go in our fleshly needs and God has plans for us and he has said that oh, I will give you this if you will go in my towards my plan. This is the thing I have kept for you. So, but we went into our fleshly needs and we are walking in that thing only. So, it, so is that uh, possible that God take that promise which he gave us, but he will do his purpose, purpose and plan? Like, like uh, suppose if he, made, if he said that I will make you a CEO of a certain company, but you have to walk in my plans, okay? But I did my fleshly needs, but after some time, my like God's plan got delayed because of my fleshly needs, but God took that promise of CEO. Is that that can happen because of the time I wasted? Yes, it delays God's uh, plan from being fulfilled in your life, and also when you give in to your fleshly choices and decisions, it also brings in a lot of unwanted circum uh, situations and challenges and difficulties that you have to face. Okay, and uh, it delays things, yes, but then when you recognize that you've gone out of God's plan and then you want to come back and, you know, you ask for forgiveness, then, you know, God is, uh, you know, he works with us. He can, you know, all the years that the locusts have eaten, he can even just you know, speed up the process, accelerate the process, and he can accomplish the plan and purpose through your life. So, uh, like, if... I am into flesh and I delayed the process of God. So like, like I said that uh, I wasted five years. Okay. And then he can like still make me the CEO of a company like that. Why not? That is God's plan and calling for your life. He will do it. Okay. Yes. Does that help? Okay. Okay. We'll move on to the next person, David. Okay. Now David was a shepherd boy, right? And um, um, when he was, you know, maybe when he was 10 to 13 years old, he started taking his father's sheep and he started, uh, you know, going into the forest, looking after his uh, uh, father's sheep. But we see that during that time, during his young age itself, you know, David had a great reputation among the people. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 18, that, you know, uh, one of the servants said that, you know, the son of Jesse... Uh, who is a Bethlehemite? He's the one who can play the harp. He's a brave man. He's a warrior. He speaks well and he's a fine looking man. And the Lord is with him. So people had a great, um, uh, you know, recognized David very greatly. They looked at him as a very fine looking, handsome man who the Lord was with him. He was a brave man. He was a warrior. He was good in playing the, uh, the liar. And also he was, you know, a good warrior. So this was even before he became king. This was even before he defeated Goliath. This reputation was great of David among the people. So when he was 17 years old, the prophet Samuel comes to anoint him as king. Now, when uh, the prophet Samuel anoints David as king, does he become the king the next day? No. How long does it take? Okay, we'll see. Okay. The next six years, we see that David is running away from whom? King Saul. Why is he running away from King Saul? King Saul was? 
too much in love with him. <laughs> then King Saul was jealous of him, was all out to kill him and take his life. And so we see that for six years, he was living in the caves. So a person who's anointed to be a king, where was he living? In the caves and running for his own life. Okay, Till the age of 23, he was living in the caves. But even in that cave, when he was living in the cave as a homeless wanderer, far from his calling as a king, we see something very interesting happening. We see that God brings about and does something very important. He brings 400 men who connect with David. And these 400 men go on to be his strong warriors, his generals in his army when he becomes king and they do great exploits. So we must understand that even in our preparation process, God is doing something that far, you know, uh, is going to last for the rest of our life. So everything that God is taking us through, sorry, everything that God is taking us through the preparation process, he's doing something that is going to last for the rest of our lives. That means he's connecting us with people, he's giving us opportunities, ordering circumstances, everything that is going to last for the rest of our lives. So preparation time is never wasted time. Okay, it might be a long time, but it's never wasted because God uses everything to train us and it's used for the rest of your life. So tell your neighbor, preparation time is never wasted time. So we see that when, you know, for 20, uh, when, um, when David was 23 years old, you know, uh, the king, King Saul died. And that's when, you know, something wonderful that David does. You know, he asked God, God, what should I do now? You know, uh, God says, go up to Hebron. That's it. Okay. Just wonderful. See, David doesn't take, oh, I have to be the next king. So Saul died. So I have to go and, you know, tell them, hey, I'm king anointed by prophet. What does he do? He inquires of God. God, what should I do? God just tells him, go to Hebron. He goes to Hebron and, you know, just one tribe, the tribe of Judah, makes him as king. And so we see that, you know, for the next seven years, David is just king over one tribe. How many tribes are there in Israel? Twelve tribes. Okay. But, you know, when it was third, when uh, David was 30 years old, you know, we read in 2 Samuel chapter 5, that the rest of Israel come to David and say that, tell him that we want you to be king over Israel. So when David was how old he became king? 30 years. Okay. And when was he anointed as, um, as, a, as a king? Huh? 17 years. So how many years did he have to wait? 13 years of waiting. So you see the preparation process, 13 years. And then we know that David reigned for, over Israel for 33 years. The next person we look at is uh, Saul, also called as Apostle Paul. Okay. Now... Apostle Paul, you know, before he was persecuting the Christians, he was a very zealous Jew. You know, he was well trained under great Jewish scholars and teachers till about the age of 30 to 33 years. So imagine 30 to 33 years, he was well read and thought about the Old Testament. That is why in most of his epistles, we see him quoting the Old Testament and how beautifully he brings about the argument to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah, to prove to the Jews that, hey, all of these rituals, all of the circumcision is not what is important, but a person is justified or made righteous through grace by faith. And if you look at his letters and read it, it's such so beautiful. Why? Because he has such in-depth knowledge of the Old Testament Torah, the law. The Old Testament. He was well scholared and studied. So for 33 years, he had studied under all of these great uh, Jewish teachers. And then, and you know, in his early 30 years, he encountered Jesus on the road to on the road to Damascus, right? And uh, God told him that he's going to be a light. He's going to use him to the Gentiles, and um, he's um, you know going to suffer greatly for the kingdom. Okay. Now, um, 
you know, many of us think that, okay, when Saul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, the very next day he became a great apostle, right? Was it true? No. Okay, let's see what happened. Okay, so when he and after he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus, he spends three years in Damascus and Arabia. Okay, so he spent some time in Damascus and immediately speaking about talking about the gospel and about Jesus Christ, and he was persecuted and he runs away into the desert in Arabia, and that is where he receives most of his revelations. So that is why Paul says, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus. That means I'm an apostle who was taught directly by Jesus Christ. I was not trained by Apostle Peter or Apostle John, but I was trained directly by Jesus Christ. So that is where he gets his revelations. Then after three years, he goes to Jerusalem. He spends 15 days in Jerusalem and he's preaching mightily about Jesus. And all the Jews says, hey, this is the same man who was persecuting the Christians. And now he's be talking about Jesus and they start persecuting um, uh, Paul as well. So Paul or Saul goes away to, um, you know, uh, uh, he goes to Tarsus. Yes, he spends the next 13 years in um, Tarsus. Okay. So the first 16 years of Saul's life, we see that, you know, um, uh, he doesn't do anything much other than just preaching and teaching here and there, you know, uh, uh, we don't know anything much about it. And these 16 years is referred to as the silent years of Apostle Paul. There's no details mentioned in the Bible about what Paul did during those 16 years. All we know is he received those revelations, he served God in preaching and teaching, and maybe the Holy Spirit did not feel it necessary to record all of those details in the Bible. Now, towards the end of those 16 years, you know, a man named Barnabas goes, goes from Antioch to Tarsus. He brings Saul to Antioch, okay, and where Paul preaches in the church there for a year. And after 17 years, we see that, you know, we read in the Bible in Acts chapter 13, where the Holy Spirit tells all the believers who were gathered in the church at Antioch, separate for me, Saul and Barnabas, for the work that I have called them to do. And then we see Paul goes on his first missionary journey. Acts chapter 14, verse 14. How many missionary journeys that Paul goes through? Three, right? So we see what is the point I'm, we are trying to make here is, you know, that Paul had to wait how many years after his call on the road to Damascus? 17 years, right? 17 years he had to wait. So what is the point? Now, all of these individuals like Moses, like David, like Apostle Paul, understood the call of God very early in their life. Moses at the age of 40. David at the age of 17, and uh, Paul at the age of 33. But it was not until several years later, 40 years later, you know, 23 years later, or um, 17 years later, that they began to walk in the role, fully in the role that God had prepared them to be in. Okay. So the point here is God is not in a Hurry. Tell your neighbor God is in a hurry. You don't be in a hurry. All of you awake? Yes. Okay. God is not in a hurry. You don't be in a hurry to go through the preparation process. Okay. Now, we are all, always in a big hurry. We want everything to happen now. But God is not in a hurry. He takes us through the preparation process to fulfill and to get us ready to do every good work that he has prepared for us. Okay. And during this preparation process, he helps us to discover our gifts, our talents, our callings that God has placed in our lives. But there are two most important things that God wants to do through this preparation process. The first one is to develop a godly character page number 32 okay that means to bring about maturity in all areas of our life you know for god your character is very very important character is who you are in not in the open 
character is who you are in the secret right what you are watching what you are thinking what you are speaking what you are saying everything in the secret is your character and god is interested in that yes um can we can we like fasten the preparation process if we walk on god's like plan like you we can walk quicken, according to you can quicken the preparation plan if um, if we are we have godly character and we are walking on that yeah if you are learning fast obeying god then you quicken the preparation process yes so look at what jesus said in matthew chapter 9 verse 17 he says new wine must be put in what kind of wine skins new wine skins you put new wine in new wine skins why don't you put new wine in old wine skins yes the wine will you know ferment it will expand it will burst that old wine skin so you put new wine in the new wine skin so here your character is the wine skin and the wine is your anointing you know what is wine skin right in in the olden days people have this kind of a bag that they have they put the wine in okay so the wine is the anointing the wine skin is your character so if you want to receive new anointing you have to have a new character that means a transformed character your character should be in the likeness and in the nature of god okay <clears throat> also we know that the gifts the grace and the anointing comes from where where does gifts grace and anointing come from 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 god from heaven but character is built where here on the earth okay your gifts are given in a moment but character is developed throughout your life you can't develop your character in a moment you can lose your character in a moment but you take your entire lifetime to develop your character that is why god is interested in the preparation process god is more interested in your character than in your gifts and in your talents amen tell your neighbor god is more interested in your character than your gifts and your talents so who you are as a person is more important to god god is more interested in your character than in your gifts and your abilities okay but what do most of us do we focus on what more our gifts you want more anointing you're saying why is the anointing not coming anointing is not coming because your character is not developed god knows that if your character is not developed when he pours out the anointing it's going to ruin everything so that is why god does not pour out the anointing okay so most of us focus on the gifts and the abilities but god is looking at your character who you are as a person okay the other important thing is our gifts can take us to great places but without character we cannot be there for too long you can be a great pastor of a big church but if you don't have the character you can lose that position you can be a great minister of god you can be a great ceo of a big company you can do great business you can get to great places but if you don't have the character what happens your gift cannot keep you there okay so without godly character you cannot reach greater heights okay and also we won't have the ability to stay there okay but when we make mistakes and challenges yes we will fall back but that is when we go back to god repent ask for forgiveness and change and walk in christ likeness or be more like christ that is why we must let god build our character character produces what the bible says character produces oh uh, sorry tri uh, tribulations difficulties produces what character perseverance perseverance produces hope hope character okay so uh, we must let god build our character because god desires truth in our inward being that is what psalms chapter 51 verse 6 says God is looking at truth in your inward being. We can speak truth from our mouth, but our heart can be far away from the truth. So God is not looking at what you speak in your mouth. 
how you behave like an holy angel but god is looking at your heart how you are inside your character okay the second uh, the in the uh, the second thing is god wants us to be mature in all areas so the preparation process that god takes us firstly god wants us to have a godly character the second one and c wants us to bring us to maturity in all areas of our life okay um look at what ephesians chapter 4 don't read the entire verses there can you just please read verse 13 someone can read ephesians 4 13 please who has the mic till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ amen so it says god wants us to grow and in, in maturity we he wants us to be mature till what is the level of maturity where should we reach the fullness of christ that means what till we are like christ in every area of our lives okay look at what what verse 15 says can you please read verse 15 but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head christ so here it says what must we grow up into all things some things few things how many things all things in all things in that means in all areas of our life we have to grow to become like whom like our lord and savior jesus christ okay not just in few areas but in all areas of our lives so sometimes we can only focus on a few areas but you know the bible says that in all areas in all things we need to be like him we need to be mature like him in every aspect of our lives that is what god wants okay so god wants to bring us to maturity in all areas whether it's in relation in our relationships with people in our gifts in our callings in our obedience in all areas he wants us to be mature okay but we need to know that growing into godly character growing into maturity in all areas is progressive that means it happens slowly step by step it's not going to happen overnight okay you can't just say okay god i want to be mature in all areas thank you amen and you know next day you are mature in all areas no you have to grow slowly it's progressive okay it it's step by step so it takes time to build character okay and it also takes a lot of hard work to build character yes or no character is lot of hard work some things we have to say no some things we have to say yes some things we have you know we have to be diligent we have to be sincere we have to be faithful even if nobody is watching us we still have to be diligent and faithful right i don't have pass ashish always watching over whether i'm putting 8 hours of work whether i'm doing my work but i know who's watching me god so even in those little things i need to be faithful and sincere otherwise god cannot use me god cannot use us okay so each time we are growing each time we are obeying god we are moving into a new level of obedience and uh, you know when we are moving into a new level of obedience because we are growing god takes us and entrusts us with a greater measure of gifts and anointing so some of you say hey why is that person more gifted than me why is that person also worship leader but he's more or she's more anointed than me i'm also a pastor but that pastor preaches so much more of the anointing than me why the answer is they have growing in their level of obedience okay so when we grow in our level of obedience god takes us uses us more and trusts us with a greater measure of anointing and gifting okay so that is what we need to do that is how we can walk in what god has called us to do okay how does god prepare us for different things how does god prepare us what do you think god uses to prepare us by the word his word yes he uses his word okay uh, look at second timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and 17 can somebody read that please all scripture is given by inspiration of god 
and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly e equipped for every good work. Thank you. Amen. So God's word corrects us, trains us, instructs us in the right way. Some of us don't like anyone instructing us, telling us what to do, teaching teaching us, correcting us, instructing us to do the right things. But why does the word of God do it? So that we can be complete, equipped for every good work. Okay. So that is why God's word is important. So the more time we develop or meditate and med devote our time in reading God's word, you know, it helps us, it trains us, it corrects us, it changes us, and it prepares us. The process gets quicker. It prepares us to fulfill every good work that God has called us. What is another thing? The Holy Spirit, yes. You know, the Holy Spirit helps us. He's the one who changes us. He's the one who sanctifies us. You know, you need to know something about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is living where? In us. But one thing we need to remember is the Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. He will tell you what is right and wrong. But if you don't do it, he won't push you. He won't force you. Right? He's very gentle. So the more we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, that's the amount of, sanct the, uh, the amount of sanctification work that he does in us. If he say, I want to do this, I want to use bad words, I want to gossip, I want to make fun, I want to make fun of others, I want to cheat. I want to copy. The Holy Spirit will allow us. The level we allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, that is the amount or the level that he will extend, that he will go to sanctify us or cleanse us or purify us. So some of you are saying, why isn't the Holy Spirit cleansing me and washing me and sanctifying me? It's because you are not giving him the permission. You are not giving him the authority and the right. If you say, Holy Spirit, sanctify my mind, it's done. Sanctify my heart. It's done. Sanctify my lips. It's done. Sanctify my eyes that I can see good things. It's done. Amen. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit. We'll come back after the break and look at how God prepares us. Thank you.